Now, as I said, it is a beautiful day in the neighborhood, although security experts warn that uh, we're in danger of uh, having some not so beautiful days if we don't get a handle on our uh, nuclear issue. And we're closer to nuclear war than we've ever been. Scientific studies show that even a very limited nuclear war involving a very tiny fraction of the world's weapons would trigger, trigger global climate catastrophe and famine. Politicians, the media, and the general public are paying scant attention. Our speaker today, Ira Helfand, MD, whom I'll introduce at greater length in a short while, will help us understand the magnitude of the nuclear threat and, and I hope offer ideas on, on how we can help to mitigate it. So, Ira Helfand, MD, is a member of the International Steering Group of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, otherwise known as ICANN which itself is the, was the recipient of the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. He's also the immediate past president of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, the founding partner of ICANN, and itself the recipient of the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize. Um, Ira is also the co-founder and past president of Physicians for Social Responsibility, which is the U.S. affiliate of the International, um, uh, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And in May of 2016, he chaired the, the, the session on humanitarian consequences of nuclear war at the United Nations Open-Ended Working Group meeting in Geneva that led to the successful negotiation of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in the summer of 2017. On September 20th of that year, he was present at the signing ceremony for the treaty. He's lectured widely in the United States and in India, China, Japan, Korea, Russia, South Africa, Israel, Pakistan, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, and throughout Europe. And today, thanks to Zoom, and also thanks to Ira, we're honored to welcome him to our platform at the Ethical Culture Society of Bergen County in Teaneck, New Jersey. So welcome. And Ira, the uh, platform is well, yours. Thank you for that introduction. And thanks to all of you for inviting me to be with you this morning. Uh, and thank you for, for um, consenting to talk about this rather difficult subject. Um, you know, it, it is a beautiful uh, early fall morning, and there are more pleasant things that we could all be doing than talking about nuclear war today. But, you know, I, I've taken to uh, acknowledging to audiences recently that I think we really only have two choices. We either talk about nuclear war, as unpleasant as that is, and do something about it, or we're going to have a nuclear war, which is going to be a whole lot less pleasant even still. Um, Earlier, you, you mentioned that experts are warning us that the danger of nuclear war is greater than it's ever been. And this is the reality at the moment. Uh, and an important aspect of that reality is the, dis the disconnect between that enormous danger that we're facing and the lack of recognition of that danger, the lack of attention to that danger. Um, many of us are old enough to remember the anti-nuclear moment, the 1980s. Um, at that point, the danger of nuclear war was also very great, although not, it turns out, as great as it is today. But our understanding of that was much greater than it is today. Millions of people all around the world, in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, even in the Soviet Union, took political action. They took to the streets. They demanded that something be done because they were terrified that we were going to have a nuclear war that would end the world. Um, that political action was enormously important. It was the background against which the United States and the Soviet Union made a profound fundamental change in their nuclear policy. In 1981, when he became president, Ronald Reagan was an advocate of the notion that the United States could fight and win a nuclear war. He actually commissioned and saw the uh, deployment of weapon systems in Europe, the Pershing missiles, that were specifically designed to enable the United States to be able to launch a nuclear war against the Soviet Union. It was a crazy understanding of the world, but that was the policy of the United States at that point. 
Four years later, in 1985, he joined with Mikhail Gorbachev in declaring that nuclear war could never be won and must never be fought. It was a 180 degree change in US nuclear policy. And the Soviet policy had undergone a similar complete reversal. And that was partially due to the fact that these two leaders, whatever their other flaws may have been, were able to understand what was going to happen if a nuclear war took place and to understand that there was no issue dividing their countries that was worth risking that disastrous outcome. But it was even more due to the fact that they operated in a space where millions of people were telling them this, pushing them to do the right thing, giving them room to do the right thing. Today, we face a danger that is even greater. I'll talk about that in a minute. But we don't have a comparable movement of people around the world demanding that there be this kind of change, this retreat, this back from the brink of nuclear war. And that is the great challenge, I think, that we all face. In this moment, given all the other problems that we are dealing with, the pandemic, climate change, racial injustice, the economic crisis in this country resulting from the pandemic, all these problems and others, how do we also summon the energy to focus on this problem, which I would argue is transcends all the others. Because if we don't get this one right, if we don't prevent nuclear war, we're not gonna be around to deal with any of the other problems. So let me talk first of all about why the danger is so great, and then take a few minutes to remind us of what's gonna happen if we fail to confront this danger successfully, and then talk about what it is that we can do because there are things we can do about this. So first of all, why is the danger so much greater than it has been? Well, <clears throat> there are a whole bunch of factors that, are, that lead into this. Several of them relate to geopolitical rivalries in the world, which have gotten more intense over the last half decade. Relations between the United States and Russia are the worst they've been since the end of the Cold War. You know, in the mid 1990s, we viewed Russia as basically the way we, we viewed other countries in Europe. We don't anymore. We view them as a major rival. We are both US and Russia engaged in programs to enhance our nuclear arsenals. US planning to spend nearly $2 trillion over the next 30 years to do this. Um, we threaten each other. We conduct military exercises in which we practice the use of nuclear weapons. It's a situation that we never expected to find ourselves in again, but we're here. And we need to understand that and we need to react to that. Relations between the United States and China are the worst they have been in 40 years. During the last decade of the Cold War, the United States and China forged a very close relationship, uh, partially to contain the Soviet Union, but then to develop an extraordinary economic relationship uh, that was felt to be mutually beneficial to both countries. That's not the situation anymore. The United States and China view each other as rivals for world domination, and they are acting like that. There, there's a military dimension to this. Uh, the United, it's not just the economic rivalry. The United States and China are both embarked on, on, on these modernization programs uh, of their nuclear arsenals. And both sides talk openly about the possibility of war between the United States and China, uh, particularly over the issue of Taiwan. Uh, the situation with North Korea is, is well known to us all. Uh, in many ways, it's the least dangerous of, of these geopolitical rivalries, but it is not something which we can ignore. It is a real danger. And whatever minimal progress was made during the, the second year of the Trump administration to lessen the tension between the United States and North Korea, that has evaporated also. And we are again on something of a collision course with the North Korean regime. The fourth geopolitical rivalry that is the one which I actually worry the most about is the one which gets the least attention here in the United States, and that's the situation between India and Pakistan. Uh, these countries have fought at least four wars, depending how you count some of the uh, minor skirmishes between them, but four major wars uh, in the last 70 years. They almost went to war twice last year. Both of these countries have significant nuclear arsenals, and they have military doctrines which indicate that if there is another war between them, it is almost certain to be a nuclear war one which will be a disaster, not only for the people in South Asia, but as I will talk about in a few minutes, for the entire world. So there are these four geopolitical flashpoints that are driving us 
in the wrong direction, that are increasing the danger of nuclear war. There are some other factors as well. One of these is climate change. And I think we don't necessarily think of these two in this, the connection between these two, but we, we should. Um, the nuclear powers, the nuclear armed states have been telling us for decades that it is their plan to get rid of their nuclear weapons at some point in the future, when the world is safer, when they can do this without compromising their security. The problem is the world isn't getting safer. And the main thing which is driving us to a more dangerous place is climate change. And even if we do everything that we're supposed to, to limit the worst effects of the climate crisis, it is going to progress over the next decades. It's going to get a bit hotter. There are going to be more weather extremes. There are going to be more areas of drought, more areas of flooding, more areas that are submerged by rising sea level. And as these forces play out, they're going to put tremendous pressure on societies all around the world. And that's going to crank up the likelihood of conflict within countries as people fight for diminishing resources and between countries for the same reason. And as that process plays out, if nuclear weapons are still around, if they're still on the table and available to the nations of the world, the chance that they're going to get used is going to increase. And again, South Asia is a particular concern in this regard because of the very severe impact that climate change is going to have on both India and Pakistan. Um, the other consideration that I think we need to worry about in, as a factor leading to an increase of nuclear war is the increasing likelihood of cyber terrorism. We used to think that the major threat we faced from terrorists with regards to nuclear weapons was the possibility that a terrorist group could get hold of maybe one, maybe two, probably small nuclear warheads and blow them up in a city like New York or like Tel Aviv or Moscow or Bombay. What we now understand is that the greater danger posed in this regard is that terrorists could create a, a successful hacking operation into the command and control centers of one or another of the nuclear powers and either directly cause the launch of their missiles or perhaps more likely cause the country being attacked, the country being hacked, I should say, to believe that it is under attack and therefore to launch retaliation against a country which is not actually attacking it. Um, this is a really scary possibility. And the cybersecurity people in the US government stay awake nights worrying about this because they know that when it comes to cyber terrorism, the offense always has the upper hand because the defense doesn't know what the next attack is going to look like. And we know that there are literally hundreds of incursions into US defense related security protected computer systems every day. And it is really only a matter of time before the terrorists figure out how to hack into the nuclear command and control systems. So for all of these reasons, the danger of nuclear war is much greater than it has been in the past and it is growing all the time. So what happens if the worst happens and we experience a nuclear war? Well, all of us have sort of a general understanding of, of what this would involve. I mean, it's a cliche that a nuclear war would be the end of the world. But I think we also need to understand how much we protect ourselves from really understanding what we're talking about here. The phrase, the end of the world, isn't really meant as a description of what's going to happen. It's meant as a catch-all phrase that we can use to dismiss the reality of nuclear war. We, when last year was the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and in uh, at the time of that anniversary, the media were flooded with pictures of what Hiroshima and Nagasaki looked like in 1945. And I think most of us have those images of, you know, in our minds at, at some point. It, th this was a very powerful warning about what nuclear weapons can do. But the main thing we need to understand about nuclear weapons today is that the devastation in Japan in 1945 does not begin mm -hmm. to prepare us for the level of destruction that will occur if nuclear weapons are used again today. Because it's not going to be one small Hiroshima-sized bomb on one or maybe two cities if the US and Russia go to war or India and Pakistan go to war. It's gonna be many weapons, each many times larger than the Hiroshima Nagasaki bomb, falling on many cities. A study that we did back in 2003, 2002 rather, showed that if only 300 
of the warheads in the Russian arsenal got through to cities in the United States. And the Russians have 6,000 warheads, 1,500 of them deployed. If only 300 of those got through to targets in industrial urban centers in the United States, something like 100 million Americans would die in the first half hour. The entire economic infrastructure of the country would be destroyed. Everything that we rely on to keep ourselves alive, you know, the, the, the grid, uh, the internet, the food distribution system, the fuel distribution system, the banking system, it would all be gone. And the vast majority of people who did not die in that first afternoon would die over the coming months as society collapsed around them and they were unable to feed themselves, unable to shelter themselves, unable to heat their homes the following winter. The same level of the destruction would take place in Russia. And if Europe and, and Canada were drawn into the war through NATO, the same would happen in those countries as well. But this direct effect of nuclear warheads, the explosions, the fires, the radiation that would kill so many people promptly is only part of the story. Because if the United States and Russia go to war, the smoke that will be lofted into the atmosphere by the fires this war causes will essentially produce a nuclear ice age. Temperatures across the planet mm -hmm. will fall in a matter of days by anywhere from, well, an, an average 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in the interior regions of North America and Eurasia, the temperatures will fall 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. For three days in the Northern Hemisphere, there will not be a single day when the temperature does not at some point drop below freezing. And under those conditions, all the ecosystems that have evolved since the end of the last ice age, you know, 14,000 years ago, these ecosystems will collapse, food production will stop, and the vast majority of the human race will starve to death. Now, we've had some vague understanding of this reality going back to the 1980s when Carl Sagan and his colleagues first warned us about nuclear winter. But what we didn't know then was that even a much more limited nuclear war would also cause worldwide disruption. And what we do know now, because the studies have been done, is that even a very limited war in South Asia involving as few as 100 Hiroshima-sized warheads, less than one half of 1% of the world's nuclear arsenals, that war would not only kill 20 million people in South Asia promptly in the first week, but it also would cause enough climate disruption, not to produce a full-fledged nuclear winter, but to cause the collapse of food production across the planet and a famine that would put at risk at least 2 billion people. That would not be the extinction of our species, which might occur with a war between the United States and Russia, but it would unquestionably be the end of civilization as we know it. No civilization in our history has ever withstood a shock of this magnitude. And there is no reason to believe that a very complex, fragile economic system, which we all depend on, would survive that kind of disruption. Now, a war between India and Pakistan could be unfolding as we're sitting here this morning. They went to war, almost went to war twice last year, and the conditions in South Asia remain profoundly unstable, and they're getting worse all the time. So we need to understand that even as we try to deal with the other issues before us, we cannot afford to ignore the danger of nuclear war. If the situation is this dire, why are we bothering to talk about it? Why don't we just, you know, enjoy this lovely fall morning? Well, the most important thing I have to say to you this morning is this. The horrible things that I have described are the future that will be if we don't take action. But they are not the future that must be. Nuclear weapons are not a force of nature. It's not like there's an asteroid coming at the planet and there's nothing we can do about it. These are little machines. Most of them are about the size of the chair that I'm sitting in. We've built them with our own hands and we know how to take them apart. We've dismantled since the height of the Cold War over 40,000 nuclear warheads. This is a simple technology. We know exactly what to do. What we haven't done is to muster the political will to dismantle the 14,000 that remain in the world today. And that is what we need to do. We need to create that political will again for fundamental change in nuclear policy, to get the nuclear armed states to understand that these weapons 
do not make them more secure, that they are the greatest threat to their security and that their security and the security of the entire world demands that we eliminate them completely. Now there has been some, I mentioned before that we don't have the kind of movement that we need, and that's certainly true, but there also has been some substantial movement in the right direction in the last couple of years. Internationally, nations which do not have nuclear weapons have finally put their foot down and said they will not tolerate this anymore. They came together in 2017 and negotiated the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, which outlaws not just the use of nuclear weapons, but the possession, the construction, the financing of the, of the development of these weapons. At this point, 56 countries have signed and ratified the treaty. So it has entered into law, into a force. It is now international law. Another 30 countries have signed the treaty but haven't ratified it yet. And beyond that, another 35 countries voted to adopt the treaty but have not yet signed or ratified it. All told, more than two thirds of the nations of the world have expressed their support for this idea that nuclear weapons should be made illegal. What's missing, of course, is the participation of the nine countries that actually have the weapons and their allies in military alliances like NATO, which envision the use of nuclear weapons as part of their strategic military doctrine. And that's what has to change. Now, for us living in the United States, there is a particular responsibility because not only does the United States have, along with Russia, the largest nuclear arsenal in the world, but the United States has the most open political system of the countries which could lead the way here. Um, in the 1980s, it was not the United States that led the way, it was the Soviet Union, thanks largely to the visionary leadership of Mikhail Gorbachev. There isn't a Gorbachev in either Russia or China today. It's not clear that we have a Gorbachev here in the United States either, but we have the ability to elect one or to convince the one that we have in the person we have in office now to play that role. And so that's what we need to do. We need to understand how critical the role of the US public is going to be in getting us out of this desperate situation. Recognizing that we have launched here in the United States, a campaign called Back from the Brink, the call to prevent nuclear war. It's modeled on the freeze campaign from the 1980s, which some of you may remember. Uh, it is based on a simple platform of what US nuclear policy should be, as opposed to what it currently is. And this platform has five planks. The most important is a call for the United States to enter now into negotiations with all eight other nuclear armed states for a verifiable, enforceable, time-bound agreement to eliminate the remaining nuclear weapons so that they all come into compliance with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and can join in that treaty process. The campaign also asks the United States to take four unilateral actions now that will lessen the danger of nuclear war and also give momentum to this effort. We call the United States to abandon first use policy, to say we'll never use nuclear weapons first. We call on the United States to take its weapons off hair trigger alert so they cannot be launched by cyber attack. We call on the United States to change the system whereby the president of the United States acting on his or her sole authority can launch nuclear weapons without anybody else having a say in the decision. And we call on the United States to abandon plans to spend $1.7 to $2 trillion over the next 30 years, enhancing every aspect of the nuclear arsenal and driving a worldwide nuclear arms race. So far, this campaign has been endorsed by over 380 uh, uh, NGO organizations around the country, by 53 cities and towns, and by six state legislative bodies, and uh, including the New Jersey uh, State Assembly. Um, and it is our hope that we will, over the next couple of years, greatly expand the scope of this campaign. Uh, there is a resolution that will be introduced before the Congress uh, endorsing this campaign. We will be trying to get members of Congress to endorse it. We want to get more cities and towns to pass resolutions endorsing this platform. We want to get more NGOs to endorse this platform. The idea is that if we get enough people to say this is what US nuclear policy should be, we essentially create a national consensus. And that provides the basis for change in policy uh, at the, the level of, of the government in Washington. So I am very worried about the future. 
Uh, I have nuclear nightmares for the first time since the 1980s, but I'm also hopeful that there's something we can do about it. And I think that I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk with you this morning. I think that people who belong to communities have a particular role to play in this process. When I talk to people, the reaction I often get is, look, this is an enormous problem. I'm one little guy here. What can I do about this? But if we belong to a community, if we're part of a group like the Ethical Cultural Society, we're not alone in this. We have allies. We have people who we can work with. And I would encourage you as a group to sit down and figure out what it is that you can do in Bergen County, which cities and towns you can appeal to to pass back for the Bergen County resolutions, what other communities, perhaps in the faith community, you can reach out to to get to endorse this. And New Jersey Peace Action has been very active in this campaign. And if any of you have ties to the New Jersey Peace Action organization, uh, it would be worth being in touch with them. And if you don't have ties, it'd be worth developing them and figuring out how you can work with them uh, to bring about this kind of change. You know, all of us want to do something good with our life. Uh, the motto of ethical culture is deed before creed. You want to do things that are the right things to do. We have been given, those of us living today, the opportunity to save the world. This is an incredible responsibility and an enormous burden that we all shoulder, but it is also an amazing opportunity to do what we want to do with our lives, to make a difference, to do something good. We have the chance to save the world. So let's act on that. Um, thanks again very much for listening to this painful material this morning. I appreciate your, your willing to, to do that and your consideration of this issue. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or to uh, entertain any discussion that people have. Ira, thank you so much for more than describing the horrors that will result from failure to act now, but also for giving us suggestions on what we can possibly do about it. Um, we have our marching orders. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open the uh, floor in the meeting house and uh, among the Zoom audience uh, to ask any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Halfin, for this uh, wonderful uh, and informative talk and for your work. Uh, it seems to me with the advent of things like kinetic weapons, cyber weapons that you mentioned, and of course things like the massive ordnance air blast weapon, also known as the mother of all bombs, that while nuclear war is certainly an, a, a serious threat, um, perhaps uh, just as serious is war. And so I guess I'd like to ask uh, your thoughts uh, around that in terms of the structures for peace that can be developed uh, to prevent war in general. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a great question, thanks. Uh, you know, obviously we have seen incredibly horrible destructive wars not using nuclear weapons uh, over the last, especially over the last 30 years. Um, and this is a gigantic problem in its own right. I do distinguish somewhat, however, between the general problem of war and the particular problem of nuclear war. Um, nuclear weapons have the ability to end our civilization and our species, and no other weapons have that ability. Um, we have the ability, I think, to eliminate nuclear weapons very quickly. Eliminating war, I think, is probably going to take a longer period of time. And I don't think we have the luxury of waiting for a peaceful world um, because the danger of nuclear war is so great and so imminent. And so while supporting you know, all kinds of general peace initiatives, I think it's imperative that we single out the particular problem posed by nuclear weapons and address that problem. You know, I'm a doc, it's kind of a triage decision. My patient has heart disease and they've got diabetes, they've got high blood pressure. All of these things are, are very bad, but right at the moment they're bleeding to death. I need to stop the bleeding first and then I can deal with the other problems that the patient has. Uh, I think that's the situation that we're in. 
if we don't get rid of these nuclear weapons, we're not gonna be around to deal with the greater other problems, including the general problem of war. And one of the things about nuclear weapons, I think is important to us, for us to realize is this would be a relatively simple problem to address. If this is not like climate change, that requires that literally billions of people around the planet change the way they live. This is 14,000 weapons that need to be dismantled. We can do this in about six or seven years. The experts tell us that's how long it would literally take to just to take them all apart if we just make the decision to do it. So I think we really do need to focus in on this particular aspect of the war and peace problem. And then we can address the broader problems as well. Thank you, Ira. Does anyone else have any questions? I'm seeing, I just want to remark that I'm seeing in the chat window that the, we have real grounds for hope. We have people saying that we have Lucy saying that I believe our social action committee has a role to play here in terms of educating people and connecting with other organizations and communities, other members. Elliot says, what an important message. Uh, Mary Matsui, uh, Ira, thanks you for a very intense, inspiring talk on a topic floating around in the background these days. Um, and we have you uh, suggesting that we contact uh, the website preventnuclearwar.org. And again, from Lucy, I never thought a private citizen could do anything about this. Now I know collectively we can. So your message is getting through. Does anyone else have a question for Ira? So what I think is that all these uh, issues about the use of nuclear weapons, when it comes to the cultures that really value their life and living, it's kind of easier to, I mean, not very easy, but easier to convince them not to do this. But what is really worrisome is now the cultures that actually like to die, like the jihad or who, the cultures that promote suicide bombings even for young kids. So when they are likely to get their hands on these nuclear weapons, that's really the most worrisome thing. Like, for example, I come from India, and I know that Indians <laughs> love to li live, and it's a life-loving culture. So is the Pakistani mainstream culture. But now that the Taliban is influencing Pakistan, and it's in such a close contact with Pakistan, it really worries. And is there something we can do to get these cultures educated about all this weird, I mean, the, the way they love to die, but they should not be doing this. Thank yeah, you. A, a terrific question. Uh, and I think, you know, it's not just uh, the Taliban, but there are, are movements in, in other religious traditions that sort of welcome the end of the world uh, as a good thing. Uh, and of course, now that we have put in our own hands the means of bringing that about, that's particularly worrisome. Again, I think it speaks to the urgent need to get these weapons off the table. Um, the situation in South Asia, as I mentioned before, is my particular concern. Uh, I, I am very worried about the possibility of war between India and Pakistan. And it is quite possible that this would start with a terrorist attack, not necessarily one involving nuclear weapons. It could be uh, just another attack on, on the parliament in, in Delhi or on a hotel in Mumbai as have taken place in the last decade, the last two decades rather, and have on those occasions almost brought us to war between India and Pakistan. Um, the Pakistani nuclear arsenal in particular is quite large at this point. It's 160 warheads. Um, and there are grave concerns about the security of that arsenal, given the ties between some in the Pakistani military and the Taliban. Um, Pakistan is going to be one of the countries which is most difficult to bring into a process of eliminating its nuclear arsenal because of its fears of India, which is a much larger and more powerful country. Um, these are some of the challenges we're going to face in the negotiations to get rid of these weapons. But I think the situation merely underlines the urgency of eliminating the Indian and Pakistani nuclear arsenals. Fortunately, <clears throat> excuse me, the construction of nuclear weapons is not an easy thing to do. It's a large industrial process, um, either separating plutonium or enriching uranium, not things that you can do in your backyard, uh, which is not true, by the way, of chemical biological weapons, which you can make in your, in your backyard. Uh, but nuclear weapons require a fairly large industrial uh, uh, project. And therefore, if we 
get rid of the weapons that exist, it is relatively possible to, con to monitor the carefully societies around the world to make sure nobody else is building new ones. Uh, and obviously this process of getting rid of nuclear weapons is going to need to involve very intrusive inspection processes in all the countries that have them to make sure that they have in fact got rid of their weapons. Um, a technically difficult problem, but something which is doable. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank, thank our speaker um, for educating us on this issue this morning. But I have to admit that my largest fear, my biggest fear is the fear that the nuclear explosions will come not from people hitting the button, but by cyber terrorists. What is it that we need to do to prevent something like this from happening? I mean, we, we know that people are human, that these men are, and women are human. And so there's some kind of feeling about whether they want to press the button. But when it comes to the computer, it's not human and programs can easily be written to destroy us. And that's what I'm for fear for. Um, and I share that fear, Pam. I, I think that that is, um, in many ways, perhaps the most dangerous possibility. Um, the first thing we need to do is take the weapons off hair trigger alert. Um, the, the, we have, and the Russians have, each about a thousand warheads that are on missiles that literally require just the press of a button to launch. And um, those are the ones which are vulnerable to cyber terrorism, uh, either a cyber attack which actually launches them or a cyber attack which convinces the country that it's got just minutes to react and it has to launch its weapons right away. Mm -hmm. um, and so the short-term quick solution to this problem is to get these weapons off air to alert. But the broader problem remains, as long as these weapons exist and are linked to computer systems in any way, uh, the possibility of cyber terrorism leading to unintended nuclear war is there. And the solution, I think, therefore, requires that the weapons themselves be eliminated. And um, I think, you know, it's, it's perhaps this fear of cyber terrorism that was the final straw for many of the people uh, in the nuclear establishment who are now turning against nuclear weapons. We, you know, we have this phenomenon where people like um, William Perry, the former Secretary of Defense, or George Shultz, the, the late uh, former Secretary of State, architects of our nuclear um, policy over the last decades, now say we have to get rid of the weapons. They've changed their mind. I think it's too dangerous to have these weapons. Henry Kissinger has joined this camp. And I think part of what has, has swung them around is the, the growing understanding that the situation is out of control. And one of the main reasons why it's out of control is because of the danger of cyber terrorism. So it, 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 it is a grave threat and one which maybe will help us understand the urgency of taking action. Thank you. Uh, Ken, uh, I see that Ed Lippiner also has his hand up. Uh, yes, I uh, commend your uh, very compelling uh, presentation and uh, not to uh, denigrate any uh, your, uh, focus, but I, I just wonder whether there is not a more insidious threat within our world, and that would be uh, the development of biological weapons, which uh, it, it would be even less able to be uh, discovered and, and attacks could be launched and only later would one realize that this is taking place. So, I mean, we're not 100% sure that the current uh, pandemic we're experiencing uh, had some uh, malevolent uh, origins, in fact. Uh, so, um, you know, that could do, I think, it is equally disruptive to the world economy, as we can see. And perhaps uh, it's, it, it's less, uh, it has less of a uh, dramatic impact uh, in terms of uh, physical destruction, but I think it 
it's equal in stature to the risk that your organization is trying to address. Um, I wonder what you have to say about that. Well, it's certainly true that, that biological warfare uh, has potential to be extraordinarily destructive to human life. Um, but at the moment, uh, so far as we know, no country has an arsenal of biological weapons. They are prohibited by treaty already. Uh, and in contrast to that, we know that there are 14,000 nuclear warheads in the world, primed and ready to go off. So I think that we, we need to you know, make an analysis of what are the problems that we're facing today. And in that uh, analysis, I think the, the answer is that we need to deal with the nuclear problem right now because it's here. Uh, one of the things about getting rid of nuclear weapons that will be a great positive in addition to saving the world uh, is that I think it can be a model for how to move forward on these other problems. You know, as I mentioned, getting rid of nuclear weapons would be relatively easy. We could do this by the end of this decade. Uh, if we made the decision in the next two or three years to do that. Um, and in the process of doing that, we would necessarily create a different kind of relationship between the major powers who have these weapons. It's going to require them to cooperate. As the United States and the Soviet Union started to cooperate during the end of the Cold War. And that pattern of interaction between the states will both serve our efforts to contain the climate crisis. It can be a model for the kind of cooperation, we're going to need to deal with that. And it can also be a model for how we deal with other military-based threats like chemical warfare, biological warfare. So I think that, that this is the place where we need to start. And by starting here, we can also be working to help address these other dangers that you've just suggested. Are there any other questions? We have Susan Mursky on Zoom. Susan, please unmute yourself and ask your question or make your comment. Hi, uh, thank you for uh, letting me join this discussion. Although from Massachusetts, I was a member of the Essex County Ethical Culture Society and carry that with me. Uh, nuclear weapons uh, and the danger of nuclear weapons uh, being used both by intent or by accident, of which there have been some possibilities, uh, is, uh, stays with me and is a, a great concern. Uh, I was able to have our community be a back from the brink city, which raised awareness. I, I find that I talk with people who have the same concern that I do, but realize how important it is to be able to speak with other people, to spread it out and not just speak with my own small group. I, and in talking with other people, I, I come up with uh, nuclear weapons, you know, if you take away nuclear weapons, you have more money to use for human needs, and also nuclear weapons do not make us safer. But in making a broader uh, anti-nuclear movement, do you have any other suggestions? And also, by the way, I, you know, it feels like this ethical culture society is a perfect place for people to take action. But Ira, how do we make for a broader movement? Thank you. Uh, well, thanks. Um, that is, of course, the great question. Um, we, we don't have as broad a movement as we need right now, and we've been trying to build one for some time. And I'm not sure I have the answer to that. But I, I think that the key is, is what you were talking about just a few minutes ago, which is the need for us to reach out beyond our own circles. Um, a group like the Ethical Culture Society here in, in Bergen County were it to decide that it were going to try to take action on this issue, um, you know, could have a tremendously important role in reaching out to other like-minded groups in the area, uh, to the faith communities in the area, uh, going to the city councils in the area, 
And as Susan said, when you, when you do this, you necessarily have to have conversations that involve educating people and raising their awareness about this danger, which has been largely pushed out of mind. Um, we have lots of resources in the Back from the Brain campaign. Uh, Peace Action also has lots of resources which it's developed that can be of use to people who want to work on this issue. Um, if the society decides it would like to pursue activity on this, you know, I would be happy to, to meet again with the, the Social Action Commission Committee, uh, whoever it is that would be, be sort of organizing your activity and, and work out some more clear detailed plans for what you can do going forward what, based on what others have done successfully, like Susan's work. Uh, in, in Eastern Massachusetts. Thank you. What a wonderful question. Any others? We have Richard Askins on Zoom. Richard, if you would please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, Ken, you've had your hand raised, so why don't you go first? I'm still trying to formulate the best question I can. All right, if you're gonna formulate, I do have a question. Uh, Ira, the last you know, 20 months or so, we've had uh, something else uh, preoccupying the attention of America and the world, that being the COVID crisis. And even earlier than that and ongoing, we've had, as you mentioned, the climate disasters that we're encountering. We've had, in this country, political dysfunction for some time and in, into the foreseeable future. How difficult is it to get attention on this nuclear crisis, which could trump them all, so to speak? Well, it's been really difficult, um, and, and it's not totally clear why. Uh, you know, in the 1980s, there were also severe problems facing the country, perhaps not as bad as those that we're facing right now, but people were quite able to understand the enormity of the nuclear threat uh, and the urgent need to deal with it. And, and we have not seen the same kind of understanding yet. It may be that we're simply, you know, in the late 70s, when there also wasn't a nuclear movement, and we were, we were at the beginning stage of building the understanding and the awareness. Um, I think part of the problem is that th there's almost been a conspiracy amongst the political leadership and the media to not talk about this issue. Uh, you know, when, when we go to, to the press, we're always told we don't need to talk about this. Everybody knows nuclear war is gonna be really bad. Well, well, people don't know nuclear war is gonna be really bad. Young people have no idea. They know nothing about it. Uh, and people, I mean, they've never been taught this. Uh, and people of my age, who did know a lot about nuclear war back in the 80s have for the most part really put it out of mind and forgotten about it. So there, there's this enormous task of re-educating the, the society about this danger. Um, I think that the answer insofar as I've been able to come up with one is, is to continue doing this kind of work, uh, educating people as best we can, speaking to anybody who will listen, uh, trying to publish op-ed pieces and, and, and articles in any publication that will take them. Uh, trying to find young people who know how to use social media to advance understanding of this issue. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, trying to talk to Hollywood, frankly, because the popular culture could play an enormous role in educating the public about this as it did in the past. Um, and um, it's my hope that at some point we'll get enough people doing their small, making their small contributions that will reach a point where it again breaks into the public consciousness again in the way that it needs to. And that hopefully we can do this before something truly catastrophic happens to bring it to people's attention. Uh, it's, uh, you know, th this is the great problem that we face. How do we get people's attention again? And I think each of us has a role to play in that by raising our voice. Uh, and when if enough of us raise our voices, people perhaps will, will hear. Thank you. And uh, now back to you, Richard, for your question. Um, I, w I think it would take up too much time and he partially has answered it. Thank you very much. I wanna thank the doctor for, for leading on this. None of us are perfect, but he's very sane about this and taught me some things I didn't realize and I'm happy to know more. Thank you very much. Well, thanks Richard, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Richard. And I see that Elliot, your hand is up. Please uh, proceed with your question. Yes, I was born in 1940, and in the 50s, there was tremendous fear of nuclear war, and a number of very active organizations trying to develop a sane nuclear policy. Ira, what has happened to those 
organizations, are they still around? Uh, some are. Uh, you know, when, when the Cold War ended, uh, I think there was this, you know, palpable sense of relief around the entire planet that the war, Cold War was over. And along with that, there was this idea that, well, in the nuclear dangers passed too. And a lot of the groups that focused on nuclear war either closed up shop or folk turned their attention to other issues. Some continued. My organization, Physicians for Social Responsibility, broadened its activity to include work on the climate crisis, but continued to try to maintain a focus on the nuclear war issue. The Union of Concerned Scientists did the same. Peace Action did the same. Um, uh, and there are now, as I mentioned, about 380 groups that have joined the Back to the Brink campaign. For many, this is just a, one of many concerns, but for a number of the organizations in that group, preventing nuclear war remains a central concern and something which they are really trying to focus on. Um, part of the problem I think that we have to deal with is that we, you know, it was such a relief to have the Cold War end. Uh, I mean, I can remember the fall of 1989 thinking, oh my God, we made it. We're not going to have to worry about nuclear war anymore. It's been very hard, I think, for a lot of those of us who live through the Cold War to let this back into our lives. It was so unpleasant being so frightened for so long that we just don't want to think about it. And so there's that added barrier that we have to deal with. Um, and I think that may explain part of the reason why people just, despite all the evidence, don't want to put this out there as, as an issue we have to deal with. Um, but, you know, the, I think the only antidote to that is to keep reminding ourselves and everybody else what the reality is. Uh, and eventually the truth will, I hope, get through to people and enable us to, 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 to start acting on this. Uh, the groups that are still active on the issue are doing their best. Um, they don't get a lot of support, uh, certainly from the foundation world. The funding for anti-nuclear work is, is, is unbelievably small compared to the scope of the problem. Um, and that, that creates problems. You know, uh, it, it limits the ability of these organizations to do their work if they don't have the resources that they need. But again, there has been progress in the last three or four years. Um, the level of attention to the issue has grown significantly. The number of people involved has grown significantly. Uh, we're finally starting to get the attention of some political leaders um, I think we're moving in the right direction. The question is, can we move there quickly enough? Uh, because we are in something of a race against time. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? I see no more on Zoom, Jim, so I think it's back to you. Uh, Eric. In the, uh, I think it was in the 90s, I was, uh, had the honor of visiting um, the Soviet Union with uh, uh, and was a recipient of a, a peace ruble, as they called it, which was made from melted down intermediate range missiles. I think they're the SS-10s. And uh, under the Trump administration, we withdrew from that treaty or otherwise allowed it to lapse. And um, so I guess I'm maybe a little bit of a technical question. I think one of the ideas behind it was to uh, perhaps renegotiate it to include China, which was not party to that uh, agreement. And so I guess I'd like to ask what the prospects are for moving forward with that particular type of um, treaty with the Russia and the United States and China now. Um, I think at the moment the prospects aren't great. And the reason is that that the leaders of all three of these countries are just tinkering around the edges of the nuclear problem. Uh, none of them have made a fundamental commitment uh, to getting rid of these weapons. None of them have the fundamental understanding that getting rid of these weapons is essential to their national security. They all still are uh, enamored of the idea that nuclear weapons somehow make them safe, and they're just playing around the edges of how to manage this relationship. Um, and as long as they do, and they're going to just focus on the details, the thing that we found in the negotiation of the TPNW was that uh, the really fundamental breakthrough came when we started talk, stopped talking about nuclear weapons as though we were playing some very complicated game of chess and started talking about nuclear weapons as a public health issue. Um, the, the, the nuclear negotiators sit down and they try to figure out how they can get a little advantage over the other country in the negotiations. Um, and as long as they're doing that, we're not going to really make substantial progress. The Chinese say they won't negotiate with the US and Russia right now because the US and Russia have so many more warheads than they do, which is true. 
Um, and it doesn't make sense for the Chinese to decrease the size of their arsenal until the Russian and US arsenals are substantially reduced down to the same level as the Chinese currently have. You know, from one perspective, that's a perfectly rational thing for the Chinese leadership to say. It would be a much more, more rational thing for them to say, hey guys, we got to get rid of all of them. And that's the kind of breakthrough that we need. We, we almost achieved that in the 1980s. Reagan and Gorbachev sat down at Reykjavik and talked about the need to get rid of all nuclear weapons. They weren't able to, to bring it off, but they understood, I think, and I, I am not a fan of Ronald Reagan, given all the other things that he did, which I think many of us found deplorable, but he got it on, nucle on the nuclear question, that these weapons were a threat to our survival and need to be gotten rid of. If we can change the conversation, if we can get it to focus on what is going to happen when these weapons are used, if we can therefore get the leadership to understand they need a fundamentally different approach to this question, then I think these negotiations will proceed in a very different way um, as the TPNW negotiations proceeded very rapidly when we made the focus of them averting a humanitarian disaster. And that requires us educating ourselves and the public about the fact that nuclear war, despite what we like to think, that it can't happen, that it actually can happen, and that if it does happen, it is going to be worse than we ever could possibly imagine. If we can get to that kind of a mindset, I think things can move in a very, very, uh, very rapidly, as opposed to the way they're moving now, which is to say they're really not moving at all. A couple of comments from the Zoom chat. Uh, Lucy had said a little while back, I think when you were still speaking, Ara, but as you said, bio chem weapons can be relatively easily made by anyone, including terrorists or cultures who want that. And that was the get going during your talk, uh, what you had said. And then she also said that Ethical has been the founder of other initiatives and that someone has to start it, I guess, in response to what can we do about this? So I wanted to read those comments. Also, Susan Mursky said, I believe the Committee for Sane Nuclear Policy morphed into Peace Action to which Dan responded, Susan Mursky is right, SANE and the nuclear freeze movement combined in the 1980s to form peace action. That's what we have from Susan at the moment. Okay, um, do we have any other questions? Uh, well, if not, I would like to thank Dr. Ira Helfand for coming to us today with not a message of, of despair, certainly, a message of great hope. And I would especially like to thank all our members and friends and guests who came up with just wonderful question, questions that helped to guide the way to what we have to do about this. I'm especially uh, interested in what we can do to make our cities back from the brink cities and our communities. Um, and to basically do with this issue what we did with guns when we took the leadership on that issue. I'm so grateful for this discussion. Thank you all. If I could uh, make one last comment in closing. Yes, of course. Uh, what's going to happen when you all leave this meeting today is that you're going to start forgetting what we've just been talking about. Um, it is very unpleasant stuff, and it is a normal and understandable and important human reaction to put this kind of unpleasant stuff out of mind. Um, it's not just forgetting, it's an active erasure that goes on and we suppress these things that are so hard and painful to think about. Uh, please don't let that happen. Um, you have to sort of coordinate off a little bit so that you can go about the normal and necessary activities of your life. But please hold on to this conversation that we've had this morning and figure out how to, how to put it in that place in your mind that motivates your behavior. Um, because that's really what needs to happen. Um, no one of us is able to deal with this problem alone, but no one of us really has the right to not do that part of the, of the work, which is our work to do. And if we all get together and work on this, especially those of us who belong to communities as you do, I, I really am optimistic that we can save the world. And, and I hope that you'll take that as the main message away from this uh, session this morning. We've got an opportunity to save the world. We really can't afford to fail in that effort. Thanks. And thank you. Thank you so much.
To learn more about us, visit our website, ethicalfocus.org, or email us at admin at ethicalfocus.org, and we'll get back to you. To make a donation, go to ethicalfocus.org slash donate. Please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and you can watch many of our past programs on our YouTube channel.